everyone. I'm Dan Lewin, CEO of the Computer History Museum. I hope everyone is well and safe. Today, I'm pleased to welcome to you our virtual event featuring AI expert Kate Crawford, who frankly is a longtime colleague of mine and is going to explore the hidden impacts of AI on our world. As you all know, our programs are made possible through the generosity of our members and donors and our trustees and sponsors. Today, we need your support more than ever as the museum is aiming to deliver on our mission, which is to decode technology for everyone. It's computing past, digital present, and the future impact on humanity. And today, here to introduce our program and speakers is Marguerite Gong Hancock, the VP of Innovation and Programming here at CHM. Marguerite? Thanks so much, Daniel. I'm, I'm thrilled to add my warm welcome to each of you joining us today. This program is part of our ongoing commitment we have to convene really meaningful conversations about the, the promise and the perils of technology and, and how together we can help shape a better future. Today's focus, power, politics, and the planetary costs of artificial intelligence. Drawing on a decade of research which has culminated in a powerful new book called The Atlas of AI, Kate Crawford will share her insights in a conversation with New York Times' Kashmir Hill. We're at a critical juncture when that requires us to ask hard questions. Whose interest does AI serve and who bears the greatest risk of harm? What are the hidden costs of AI to people and our planet? And given the underlying power dynamics, how should the use of AI be constrained? These questions won't have easy answers, but drawing on her unique atlas or a map of AI that spans from lithium mines to server farms and from distribution warehouses to government surveillance. Kate's has joined us today from Sydney, Australia to expand our, our understanding of what's underway in the empires of AI, what's at stake, and importantly, how do we make better collective decisions about what can and should come next. As is CHM tradition, I'll introduce her using five numbers. 20, the years researching technology. Seven, the age that first, she first interacted with Eliza, which was one of the first chatbots created in the MIT AI lab. 626,155, the estimated pounds of carbon dioxide produced by training a single deep learning model. 609, the number of footnotes in Atlas of AI. And four, the album's released. Uh, many of you may not know this, but she's an amazing singer. I did check out her 2020 Machines work. So if you want to hear some music, listen to that electro song. Welcome, Kate. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marguerite. It's such a pleasure to be here. Great to have you here. And, and now I'll introduce our moderator uh, joining Kate, uh, as our moderator today, is Kashmir Hill, a technology reporter at the New York Times. She writes about the unexpected and, and sometimes ominous ways that technology is changing our lives, particularly when it comes to privacy. Prior to joining the Times in 2019, uh, Kashmir worked at Gizmodo Media Group, Fusion, Forbes, and Above the Law. Her writings appeared in the New Yorker and Washington Post. She earned journalism degrees from both Duke University and New York University. Kate and Kashmir, we really look forward to your important conversation on this timely topic. Over to you. Well, it is so great to be here with you, Kate, though I can't help but feel guilty about the ecological toll of our virtual gathering after, you know, um, your exploring that quite thoroughly in the beginning of the book. Um, <laughs> so my first question, I had a planned first question, but now that I've seen your numbers, I would like to know how you wound up chatting with Eliza at age seven. That's, that's kind of a really funny story. Um, I grew up in a little town called Canberra, actually the capital of Australia, but you know, when I was there, quite a small town. Um, and at the research university there, ANU, they had a little sort of walkthrough day where kids could come and look at computational technology. And I will never forget the moment of seeing this little terminal that you could sit at and it just said Eliza. And I'm like, oh, what's Eliza? It said, you can talk to Eliza and she'll talk to you. And so I started engaging with this system, which was in fact created by the uh, one of the early figures in AI, Joseph Weizenbaum. And it was really one of the first chatbots, if you will. You know, you could ask Eliza questions and Eliza would respond. Um, Eliza was designed as a Rogerian psychotherapist, actually. So, you know, you'd ask a question and she'd ask you a question back and elicit more information. But it was a very clever idea. 
But at the same time, I think even then it contained a whole lot of questions about how and why we trust AI systems. So yeah, I have this vivid memory at age seven of going, wow, this is really interesting. What's going on here? How does this work? <laughs> and was that the moment that you decided decades later to write a critique of AIs like Eliza? Oh, clearly, yeah. At seven, I totally had decided that path. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> so what was the journey like to Atlas of AI? How did you decide to write the book? Sure. Well, look, you know, I've been uh, an academic and a researcher working on the social implications of technology for, well, 20 years now. Um, I have my anniversary of being an academic next year, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, but for me, you know, this is this has been a long journey um, and perhaps one of the, the, the big turning points for me in thinking about the way in which technological systems are changing our world. There was a project that I did starting back in 2016 with the artist Vladan Jola called Anatomy of an AI System. And what we decided to do was to map just a single Amazon Echo. You probably know those units, the little sort of beige cylinders that you might have sitting, you know, in your living room or your bedroom, you know, depending how you feel about listening devices. Um, and, you know, we basically wanted to understand what does it take to make one of these things work so that you can just you know, speak to Alexa and say, Alexa, you know, order me some toilet rolls, you know, get me a book. Um, and what we found was, in addition to just thinking about the data pipelines, which we knew quite well, we then tried to map where all of the components come from in a single echo. So we had to go back and research the mines, the smelting, the container shipping, and then all the way through to the end of life, to where these systems basically get discarded within generally about four years and, and they end up in e-waste tips in places like Ghana and Pakistan. So in charting this full cycle of birth, life and death of a single AI system, it really opened my eyes. It really sort of transformed my thinking as a researcher to realize that AI has much bigger stakes. It has these sort of planetary impacts. And so I realized after doing that project that I had to move from studying a single AI consumer device to studying the entire AI industry. Right. Like these devices, they look so clean and so fresh and it's hard to um, keep in your head that it does have such an ecological toll. And you do a really incredible job of outlining that with just this powerful scene of you, you know, in the Nevada desert at the beginning of the book where the rare um, earth, uh, mineral, you know, metals are being mined. Um, I also loved the history that you were diving into and early in the book, you were talking about the harvesting of latex for transatlantic cables in the 1800s and how during the Victorian era, basically they, um, harvested this one tree. What was it? The, I don't know how to pronounce it. Pal Palaquium guta to yeah. near extinction. And I was left with questions. I was wondering what happened when they started to run out of trees, where did they get their latex? And <laughs> as you looked at kind of the historical ecological environmental toll of the technology industry, was there anything you learned about what we are going to do today or, you know, what happens as we start running low on those resources that we need, like, um, you know, these rare metals? Fantastic question. And, and I think for me, in some ways, the story of the Palaquium gutta tree and the gutta percha latex that it produces is, is almost this extraordinarily powerful parallel for the moment that we have now. It was, in some ways, the first environmental disaster of, of the information era, sort of in the Victorian years. Um, and it was extraordinary to sort of to really trace how that happened, that, you know, it came out of a paper that was written by Michael Faraday in the late 1800s, where he realized that you could use this, this white latex from this tree to insulate the telegraph cables that would be lying on the ocean floor. But the problem was that in order to have sufficient insulation for all of that cabling, it required just extraordinary numbers of trees. So sort of to, to produce one of these cables was around 900,000 trunks of Palaquium gutta trees, which were being felled in places like Singapore and Malaysia. 
Um, and what happened was, of course, an, an extraordinary tragedy, which was that this tree was driven to extinction. It was um, basically completely gone within a period of less than 20 years to try and insulate these, these very long cables on the ocean floor. And what I find sort of really powerful about this was that sense that resources are somehow limitless, that you know, when we're creating new technological systems, that we can expect that we can just extract as much as is needed from the planet. Because we're having that moment now. Um, and for me, part of the reason why I start the book, you know, driving out to the Clayton Valley in Nevada to see the last operating lithium mine in the United States is because lithium itself is now the focus of a new crisis of availability. In fact, a report just came out last month from the University of Gothenburg, which shows that if we get really, really good at recycling lithium for things like, you know, rechargeable batteries, which we use everywhere from iPhones to, you know, Tesla Model S cars, maybe the resources we have can last until 2100. If we don't, it could be really running out as soon as 2040. And that is an extraordinary realization that these, you know, mineral resources that we assume can just keep driving planetary computation are really reaching a critical endpoint. And we have to ask, I think, much harder questions about the way that we relate to the systems that we build. So for me, you know, that was was really part of the work of Atlas of AI is not just tracing, if you will, kind of in space, the kind of impacts of artificial intelligence around the planet, but also in time, because we've been here before, you know, these stories have played out before, and in many cases have produced disasters that could have been averted. So do you know what happened when they ran out of Gouda trees? Well, they started shifting to, you know, yet another um, thing which has caused various environmental disasters on the planet, of course, which is early forms of plastic, um, which, you know, again, we're living with those legacies now. But it, it's sort of so surprising to me because, you know, that story encapsulates that attitude towards just stripping, strip mining resources on the planet, whether it be trees, minerals, but also now as we see sort of, you know, strip mining the internet, sort of extracting data to drive AI systems. So in, in many ways, this sort of forms the foundation of this idea of you know, why is AI right now working in many ways like an extractive industry, much in the way that sort of mining sort of became, you know, the, the darling of extraction in the 18th and 19th centuries. So this is the kind of moment, I think, uh, sort of a, a moment of break that we have to say, this is a moment of choice. How do we want these systems to work? And do we want them to be sort of profoundly extractive and having these extraordinary impacts across the environment, labor and data? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of these problems that kind of surface within the technology industry are, you know, as you're illustrating throughout the book, you know, deeper societal problems that are, that have, you know, economic and um, political causes that oftentimes boil down to capitalism. Uh, and many times technology becomes the lens through which we analyze, um, you know, and critique these problems. And, you know, the, the, but at the end of the day, it is a, it is a deeper problem. And I, I think the technology industry is, um, is reactive to it. I mean, I think they do take some of these critiques to heart and they try to change them, but it is a deeper problem. So how do we kind of separate these critiques and make them more meaningful or more effective where mm -hmm. we're not just kind of critiquing the technology that overlays these deeper problems? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think one of the really, there's, there's two important threads to sort of pull apart there. One is the relationship of artificial intelligence to late stage capitalism. And absolutely, so many of the dynamics that we see playing out in AI are features of the way that our current economic systems work. We have a profoundly concentrated tech sector, as you know, and that again is producing particular sorts of political economies across the world. So really, depending how you count, there are really fewer than a dozen companies that run planetary scale AI. And if you think about cloud companies, you're really talking about three or four. Um, again, this is one of the most sort of profoundly concentrated industries. You'd have to go back to the railways to find something that has sort of a fewer number of players. And that has profound impacts in terms of how economies work. But the other question to ask here is, 
could AI, as we currently understand it, function without sort of the underlying factors of late stage capitalism in terms of how we understand labor exploitation, in terms of supply chains wrapping around the planet, in terms of exploiting those differences in labor costs in different parts of the world. So in some ways, we could think of AI almost as a, a, a megafauna of capitalism, that it, it is in some ways an outgrowth of this era in which we live. And I'm thinking here of the work of uh, really extraordinary writers like Mackenzie Walk, who are asking, because of the way in which information capitalism works now, is this actually different to just underlying capitalism? Are we actually talking about something different in terms of the way that people are being interpolated by these systems, in terms of the way in which the relationship to work and value is changing? And I think that's actually a really interesting question to start asking now. You know, what are the theories of capitalism that we bring when we start to analyze large scale technologies? And does that actually point us to something else that's going on? This is not sort of traditional 20th century capitalism, but something else. And in some cases, actually, it could be more concerning. So, you know, for me, bringing in those theories of political economy is sort of a big part of what Atlas of AI is trying to do. One thing I thought was uh, fascinating, probably because I'm a privacy reporter, but was the discussion of the Panopticon. Um, mm -hmm. And I always had thought that this was just born of the fevered dreams of the philosopher Jeremy Bentham and discovered through your book that, in fact, it was something that was built in his brother's factory. And I was hoping you could talk about that just because the, I think the, you know, the Panopticon metaphor of uh, the station through which everyone is potentially being watched working as a um, means to control them is, is so powerful and it's so inter interesting. It comes right out of industry. Right. And it, and for me, it was, it was also kind of extraordinary to trace the paths of Samuel Bentham, Jeremy's, Jeremy's younger brother, who was really using these techniques of observation as a workplace tool. So for people who are unfamiliar with the Panopticon, um, it's commonly understood as a, a design that was used in jails where you would have you know, a single sort of uh, guard tower at the center, and then you would have all of the jail cells around the outside, and you wouldn't be able to see into that sort of central watching tower. So you could just presume that at any point you were being observed. So it was a way of sort of scaling up surveillance so that people would ultimately begin to internalize that sense of being observed and controlled. But in actual fact, this began much earlier than sort of in prisons. It was actually in workplaces. And so, you know, Samuel Bentham was thinking about this as almost a way of controlling workers to ensure that you're sort of extracting maximum value from them, such that they're assuming that they're always being watched uh, and will, you know, try to perform their best. And in that sense, to see that idea sort of move from workplaces to prisons to now being kind of one of the central metaphors for how we understand wide scale surveillance is really fascinating to me. And, and in the book, I look specifically at those very early workplace histories, because I think in some ways where we're starting to see AI applied in the workforce uh, as not just a technology that's being used to track work, to see how efficient you are. There are lots of companies that give you efficiency scores, for example, depending on how many emails you write or, you know, you know how many meetings you're taking, what your results are, you know, from day to day, but, but also really kind of tracking you in very intimate ways, you know, recording your face on a workplace camera, you know, tracking your sort of wellness stats as ways to actually start to make presumptions about, you know, what, what kind of you know, practices you have, how healthy you are, etc. We are looking at the sort of embedding of particular types of logics into the workplace that I think take us back to Fordism, to Taylorism, to these ideas around how do you actually monitor and control workers right down to the very muscles. Um, and so for me, you know, what, it, what I did to understand this better was to go inside an Amazon fulfillment warehouse, which is where I think you can really see these kinds of relationships of humans inside hybrid workplaces with robots and with algorithmic management. And I think that's where you start to see these, these kind of panopticon-esque uh, factors that really Samuel Bentham was talking about really brought to life in some extraordinarily horrific ways to see the toll, the physical and psychological toll in those spaces, I think was was just, to me, profoundly shocking. Yeah, there are these really invasive tools of surveillance that are, you know, tracking people at just these minute levels in order to 
as much as possible, transform them into being part of the machine, have them serve the AI. And it does, it, it, it feels like it is spreading more and more and entering more and more workplaces. You know, so many of these apps that we refer to as, you know, the tech industry are really just human beings that are being kind of controlled and move around and tracked via their smartphones. Do you think that this arc towards making humans more and more machine-like in their work is, you know, an un unbending, unceasing arc? Can we resist it? Um, it uh, I'm curious if you were able to talk to workers in Amazon factories and how they feel about the degree to which AI is kind of being used both to control their time and their bodies and, um, and really program them? Mm. Well, I mean, the, the, the quick answer to that is absolutely, we can change it arc. And, and I would say we absolutely have to, because what is at stake here is really the experience of dignity at work. And we've seen this play out most recently, of course, in Bessemer, Alabama, in the drive to create a union and to see sort of Amazon's response, which was really to try and decimate that, uh, that initiative and all of the activists who were trying to build that union was, I think, a, a fairly terrifying reminder that this is not going to be an easy fight, that in many cases, employers are looking at to Amazon and saying, we will actually deploy similar models there, which is why I think certainly, you know, this idea that somehow Amazon represents a very exceptional case is, is really not true. I think it represents the, the model that will be emulated if it is not very strongly, I think, critiqued. And, and I think this is a public conversation that we need to be having in terms of, is that the future of work that we want to see? Because so many, so many cases of these sort of debates about the future of work under AI focus on this idea of people being replaced by robots. And I think not sufficient detail is given to the way in which people are in fact just being treated more like robots, as you say. And uh, the writer Astra Taylor has this fantastic term of photomation, you know, which is this idea of, you know, we, we assume a system is automated, but in actual fact, it's hundreds or thousands of humans who are actually sitting in sort of, you know, distributed platforms around the world trying to do micro tasks to make a system appear like it's artificially intelligent. Um, and I know this is something that you've actually had some experience with, Cash, when you wrote a piece, gosh, I think it was several years ago now, where you joined one of these companies to be an invisible girlfriend to actually act like an automated system. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, there was this app, it was called Invisible Girlfriend, and it was um, so that you could create a partner for yourself. And you would fill out this little form saying what personality they would have and how you met and what their name would be. And then you would start texting with them. And a lot of people, when they first signed up for this app, just assumed that it was an AI um, because of all this programming that went into it. And then over time they started to realize, wait, it seems, this seems too human. Um, I'm not sure it's an AI and the company had kind of hidden this, but then a few investigative journalists discovered that actually the, the, the app was using a crowdsourced platform. Um, and it was a bunch of workers that were doing this. So I decided to sign up to be a worker on the crowdsourced platform and started working as an invisible girlfriend, getting paid like five cents per message. And it was, it was such hard work, but people like to do it because the other tasks that they were being assigned through this platform were just so monotonous. That was more interesting to have somebody, you know, presenting you with queries. I, I had such interesting ones. There was a, somebody who claimed that she was a teenager, who she was pregnant. And I was her invisible boyfriend who she was telling. And I just didn't, I didn't know, like, is this a person who's really going through this and she's basically play acting it or is it just somebody who is kind of doing this for fun it was just it, it was so hard to know what was happening on the other side of it um, but I do think a lot of people don't realize the degree to which AI is is not you know um, artificial intelligence from science fiction where we everything's an algorithm and the computers have it all figured out so much of it relies on humans um, to actually do the work or to provide the data, um, or to provide the kind of quality assessment or just to actually, yeah, do the work you, you talk about in the book, um, the personal assistant that was rolled out that everyone thought was automated, but again, 
the computers aren't quite that good yet. They they still need help a lot of times. That's right. And and it's interesting that, you know, the example of the personal assistant that XAI produces, which is really just lots and lots of people working really hard, as you say, like this is actually really exhausting labor that is very low paid. It's often, you know, a, you know, a few cents an hour or a few cents a message. And it, this is a story that plays out time and time again, that when systems are being developed, it's, it's really just human. So we can think of, you know, AI is people in this way. Um, and so the, the more I looked into these sorts of systems and these examples, you begin to see that, you know, AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. It is, you know, material. It's made of these material layers of minerals and energy, but also of humans working all throughout the supply chain, essentially kind of propping up this perspective of intelligence, where in actual fact, you know, it, it's not at all like human intelligence. It's in fact a series of systems that are actually profoundly built on human actions repetitively and often in, in really difficult conditions on crowdsource platforms. Why do you think the tech companies and the apps work so hard to maintain that illusion? Why do they want us to think that it's just a computer that's doing all this work? Well, you can see the appeal, right? I mean, it's this idea that somehow these systems are magical and futuristic, and, and it certainly attracts the attention of venture capitalists and funders if you can imply that you've created a system that can perform these tasks, you know, in a purely autonomous way. Um, and it's interesting, you know, the, the academic Alex Campolo and I wrote a paper about this idea of enchanted determinism, this idea that AI systems are both enchanted, which is to say that they're magical, they're otherworldly, they're alien. If you look about at the reporting on, you know, systems like AlphaGo, when it sort of had its extraordinary moment of beating a human Go master, it was, was again, the language of alien intelligence. Um, but at the same time, they're seen as deterministic, which is to say that we should trust them to be highly predictive about, you know, decisions in the world or features about a person to make decisions in criminal justice or in education or in hiring. And I think this, this dialectic of enchanted determinism is, is a really interesting kind of phenomena because when you see it at work, you can actually start to pull apart, well, this isn't a magical system. How does it work? And this isn't deterministic. These systems are flawed. They make mistakes all the time. And that hopefully will actually force us to be more skeptical and I think ask much harder questions about how we start to fold these systems into our social institutions. One thing that you spend a long time in the book um, doing is investigating the data sets that have powered this. And this is such an important part of AI. Um, I actually wonder if it's part of the illusion that it's all computers is to make us more comfortable handing over our data, feeling like there's no humans that are going to be looking at it. Um, but they do depend on the machine learning need lot, needs lots of data. Um, and there's been so much talk recently about the biases that are kind of inherent in the data and the problems with the data. And you had this, um, this anecdote in the book about a, a gang, gang crime prediction tool that had been built by some researchers based on a data set they had, they had gotten from the LAPD. And you said the researchers, um, you reported, you were writing about how they presented the tool at a conference in New Orleans and, you know, somebody asked, well, what if this data is mislabeled? What if somebody is reported to be a gang you know, member when they're not? And that the researcher said, you know, I'm just a researcher. I don't deal with the ethical questions. And I assumed that this anecdote was going to be at least a decade old, but I looked it up and it was just in 2018. It was like very recent. Um, and I was shocked to, to kind of see that. Uh, and I'm wondering what you think it's going to take to get researchers to think more about the ethics of data um, uh, or if there's some kind of change to the entire industry uh, that we need kind of an IRB that you have in academia to, 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 better, to better vet um, both the, the ethics of the data in terms of potential bias, potential um, misinformation, but also the ethics of who, who it's being taken from.
I mean, it, it, it does sound like an extraordinary story, doesn't it? But, you know, again, I hear these these kinds of comments all the time that, you know, I'm just an engineer. This is what I focus on. I don't need to think about the social or ethical implications. Um, in fact, the academic Anna Lauren Hoffman has this sort of fantastic essay around this idea of like, what is it to be just an engineer? You know, how could we create these silos without seeing that in many ways, computer science is now becoming a form of social engineering. Um, and it's interesting because you can think about how we got here by looking at the history of computer science. You know, certainly if we if we look at the way that labs were working 50 years ago, you know, these these were systems and ideas that were you know really experimental and abstract, and in many ways they weren't thinking about what would happen if you would apply this to say billions of people. And so computer science you know, emerges from the mathematical tradition, which doesn't have ethics reviews or IRBs and is not seen as a social science or something that needs to be thinking about the impacts on people and society. And unfortunately, we've seen that kind of historical trajectory come completely into conflict with the current form of machine learning, which of course is all about scale, all about affecting so many people at once across multiple industries simultaneously. And bias has become, I think, in some ways, you know, the, the, the sort of the tip of the iceberg. You know, you get to see these examples where systems are obviously going wrong. And of course, there's now a litany of examples. We could think about Apple's creditworthiness algorithm that was like down ranking women across the board. You know, we could think about systems that fail to recognize people with darker skin tones. We could think about voice recognition systems that don't recognize female sounding voices. I mean, there are so many cases, you know, from Compass to what's happening now with you know, the use of emotion recognition in hiring systems. It, it's, it's just an endless series. But for me, I think there's a deeper question that we need to ask. And back in 27, uh, 2017, rather, at the, um, the leading sort of machine learning conference, which is called NeurIPS, I gave a talk specifically on this topic called the trouble with bias. And what I was trying to do there is to sort of really share with technical communities that, you know, bias is real this is happening but part of the reason it's happening is due to these deeper classificatory logics that we use in machine learning all the time the people are being classified into things like binary gender or into sort of you know five racial categories or in some cases being uh, categorized as to whether they might be a potential criminal or categorized depending on what their supposed internal emotional state might be based on their face every one of these kinds of classificatory systems comes with histories and histories of exclusion and oppression and yet they're just built into technical systems without question so across the board part of what i think needs to happen is is, is a far more profound engagement with how we train ai systems to interpret the world and part of the way we do that is at the very beginning as you say we we train ai systems with large amounts of data called training data sets and you know these training data sets might have thousands or millions billions of pieces of data, whether that be photographs or pieces of text that have been scraped off the internet. And this then becomes ground truth for a technical system. And as a researcher, one of the things that, that I've been really working on in the last few years is actually studying those training sets, opening them up, you know, doing what Trevor Paglin and I called in a project called Excavating AI, a type of archaeology of training data sets to actually look at what these training sets have inside them and how people and ideas are being labeled. And there are so many unstable and sort of problematic training sets there that it's not a surprise to me that we're starting to see these consistent problems with AI when it's applied in the world. So I do think that as a field, there's a moment of reckoning now, which is how are technical systems being designed? How do we pay far greater attention to those ways of world making? But also, how do we train computer scientists to start asking these questions about the social and political implications of what they build? Because we can no longer afford to have people designing these incredibly powerful systems saying, I'm just an engineer. It, it simply isn't sustainable. So do you have any ideas about how we do it? There's a somebody, um, somebody in the audience who pointed out a recent report that just 6% of business leaders said they ensure that AI is used ethically. I mean, how do we get this to change? How do you, how do you force that change? 
Right. Well, I think there's multiple ways. I mean, you've raised education. That's certainly a key space in terms of how do we think about the pedagogy of computer science and engineering. But we also have to talk about regulation, because certainly this is a space that has not been regulated strongly at all for the last 20 plus years. And I think we're really living the legacy of that now. Um, you would have seen, of course, that the EU has just released its sort of draft guidelines for regulating AI for Europe. And this is the first big omnibus piece of legislation attempting to really grapple with some of these questions. And frankly, in the US, we're really far behind the eight ball. We still don't have you know, strong federal privacy regulation, let alone all of these deeper questions we're talking about today. So there's, there's a lot to do in that space. But also, I have to say, you know, the work of activists and investigative journalists like yourself um, is actually a really important way to shed light on these issues and actually start to create a public call for accountability. Because ultimately, this is a public and democratic issue. Um, and the fact that these industries have, to some degree, really just been allowed to run rampant is something that I think we're going to have to see change in the next decade. Um, you you illustrated some of the data sets that you were excavating. Um, you had photos in the book. There was um, there's there's a discussion about the attempt to use AI to kind of decode human emotion, to have cameras just look at faces and know what somebody is feeling, um, you know, whether somebody is lying or not. And so you went through these old data sets um, of how they're training the machines to read emotion. Um, and, you know, you had this uh, arresting series of photos of a woman you know, performing various emotions, obviously very uh, staged. And then, um, you know, almost a grotesque series of photos of um, people, I believe, who are in a mental, mental institution who are having different muscles in their faces, um, you know, electronically, uh, electrically uh, stimulated to see, you know, what causes different expressions. And, I, I always think about this a lot when I'm when I'm reporting on those kinds of data sets, how to both illustrate to people what they look like so they can understand, but also the ethics of how you use the photos, given the critique that you're making of the use of the photos. And I was curious how you handled that in terms of what you chose to put into the book um, to illustrate what you were talking about. Right. And it's interesting, of course, because the the history of emotional recognition by AI is is, is something that goes very far back. Um, and one of the things I do in the book is certainly look at the early history of how you know, the idea that there are you know, six universal emotions, that we all feel them, that we display them on our faces and that computers can interpret them. You know, that idea itself, you know, has been around very strongly since the 1960s. And I sort of look particularly at one psychologist by the name of Paul Ekman, who's become a sort of very powerful proponent of this idea. But even back then in the 60s, there was enormous pushback and people were saying, you know, people like Margaret Mead, you know, anthropologists were saying this idea really just avoids all of these much richer questions around context and relationality and how we emote and express ourselves differently depending on where we are. Um, so certainly for me, going into those histories and then going further back, you know, you mentioned uh, the way in which um, the images by Lavater, which he was taking in asylums in France, uh, again, sort of 200 years prior, as a way of really kind of trying to track the kind of musculature of faces to track this idea of like universality. The idea itself is so problematic and yet keeps playing out. So in terms of how do you share these images, images that are themselves, I think, very ethically burdened, you know, that's something I really sort of thought about very hard with this book. And there are, there are images that you know, that I find particularly shocking in some of the training sets that have been really created by NIST, by some of our sort of the, the national institutes for science and technology, which are based on mugshots. And, you know, these are images of people who have been arrested multiple times over the course of their lives. And again, you know, we don't know if they were charged, but these are people who have no right to say no to having their photos taken. And yet they've become a testing substrate for artificial intelligence itself, I think, a very real ethical dilemma for how these things are being used. So I think for me, part of, you know, the choices, do we look at these images or do we not? 
And certainly the way in which they're constantly used by technical systems, I think it's important when we critique them that we actually understand what they are and that we see them. But this is, you know, this is something that you have to think about very carefully, you know, are these people living, you know, do they have a right to say, should this image be used or not? Um, and unfortunately, that is not a choice that people are given right now in terms of how they're being added into AI training sets. Um, and, you know, most of us, in fact, if any of us have had photos of ourselves on the internet are probably now in an AI training set without your knowledge or consent. Um, and this, of course, makes me think of your extraordinary work reporting on Clearview AI, which became, of course, you know, a company which collected, I think, the largest uh, face training data set on Earth. Of, is it is it three billion images that they've that they've scraped? It was three billion, yeah, uh, last year when I did my initial story on them. Uh, but yes, they have many billions of photos of people that they have scraped from the web. Right. And did you check if you were in those in those sets and people? Uh, you Yes, I mean, I had the experience of, you know, met the met the founder and he took a photo of me um, and it immediately, you know, it, it, it pulls up any photos of you from the public web that they have scraped. So there were a number of photos of me that came up very quickly um, and some photos I had kind of hadn't realized were out there because they hadn't been um, labeled with my name. Uh, it was just pulling on my my face, which is quite a new and extraordinary kind of power. Uh, and he, yeah, the, the founder, who's actually an Australian, um, Juan Tanta, uh, <laughs> grew up in Canberra, actually. Um, he took a, he went to uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com, which is AI simulated people, um, where AI has been fed a lot of images of people so that it can, in, you know, invent quite realistic looking people. And he took a photo of one of those and it brought up no photos. And it was his way of demonstrating that this actually works quite well. It was, it was really extraordinary, but it raises, you know, so many ethical questions about the fact that all these people posted photos to the internet, um, not thinking about uh, maybe even unable to predict that it could someday be used to make this, um, really quite extraordinary uh, face finder that could kind of end anonymity as we have historically uh, experienced it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is questions about, it's a lot of questions about data, but it also raises this question of um, within the book, I think you're mostly kind of talking about the many ways in which AI is flawed, but there is this other future where AI gets very good um, and and gets closer to perfect, uh, you know, near perfect. And so I have two questions. And the first is how near perfect do you think artificial intelligence could be for various things? From what I've seen of Clearview, for example, it's quite good now at face recognition, um, though it has not, you know, been tested by a third party. It's only anecdotal talking to police officers about it. But then if we get to that near perfect place, how does the critique of artificial intelligence change as it is? Um, the problem is not the flaws, but that it is too good at what it does. Mm. I mean, it, it's it's such a it's such a great question, and it's such a vivid example as well to think about the Clearview AI set because, of course, this is now being used by. Uh, police departments, both in the US and around the world, it's becoming this, this sort of surveillance database uh, for sale to whoever can actually purchase it. And, and the, the questions here are not just ethical or questions of privacy, but they're really profound questions of civil society, you know, is this the way that we want societies to work. And again, the fact that this is happening in really a sort of a regulatory vacuum. I mean, there's so little that's actually sort of restraining what's happening with Clearview AI. I mean, certainly there's BIPA, which has been an important sort of biometric privacy act in, in Illinois. And that's one of the kind of small kind of carve outs. But as you know, your reporting has shown, it's extremely difficult to try and restrain companies that say, oh, we have a right to just scrape all of this information. So certainly for for Atlas of AI and in my work, it's right now it's it's certainly easy to point to where these systems are failing. Um, that is, you know, very consistent across the board. People think AI is a lot more advanced than it actually is. But it can be just as terrifying when it works. Um, and this is why I've been sort of thinking about facial recognition in particular. 
sort of the phrase I used in a piece in Nature um, a while back was that effectively these systems are harmful when they fail, but dangerous when they work. Because <laughs> actually, either way, you either have systems that are promising to do something that they cannot do, or they're actually doing something which will have these profound social implications that nobody has actually had a say. Um, and so that in itself is this kind of, I think, core issue of of undemocratic practice and the way that these systems are fundamentally shifting policing, they're shifting corporations, they're shifting our relationship to ourselves and to other people without that being a broader public and essentially democratic debate. So I think I think it is going to change. I mean, clearly, the things that these systems claim to do, such as, you know, tracking an individual they will be able to get better at doing. But there are still some of these fundamental questions um, that I think won't get resolved. So this idea of essentially attaching a label to an image and, and recognizing any object in the world. You know, that was a, you know, a challenge that was created at MIT, the sort of summer vision project, you know, decades ago. And I think it's still a challenge which is unsolved. I mean, a system can, you know, an AI system can recognize, okay, that's a cat and that's a dog. But when you actually sort of dig into what are those categories and, and what gets left out, what, what I tend to see is just all of the, the empty space, the parts of the world that aren't categorized and understood and classified, that simply get written out of the way that worlds represent in, tech, in technical systems. Um, and I think you know, that, is a, that is a sort of a deep epistemological question. You know, what is it? in terms of when you take the infinite complexity of the world and you try to create a map that will sort of represent all of the things in there, what does that leave out? And it will always leave things out. It will always come up with simplifications and proxies for the universe that we live in. And those simplifications and proxies have a price. They, they have a sort of a political lens to them. So I don't think these questions are going away as these systems become quote unquote more accurate at certain tasks. It doesn't resolve these sort of philosophical issues around the, the gaps and the, the if you will, sort of the very kind of rough heuristics that are used to make AI function. When you have done the excavation, you've gone into these data sets, which, I mean, I don't think people had really gone into them before, you know, you um, with various partners, Trevor Paglin, you know, looked at them and saw what was in there, saw the way that these um, images have been labeled in, you know, inaccurate, imprecise, insensitive, racist ways. What has come of that when you've pointed out that the data sets are flawed? What happens next? Do they get fixed? To what extent do they get fixed? Do the tools that are built on them get taken down? Well, what have you seen happen so far? And what does that tell us about the future of what could happen to rectify some of these mistakes that are not uncovered yet? Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's been a really interesting journey, in fact. I mean, certainly with the Excavating AI project with Trevor Paglin, we spent over two years looking at hundreds and hundreds of training data sets and, and actually opened them up and looked at them, which is you know extremely rare. Like in many cases, engineers will just apply training data sets just like, you know, it's just like a, a tool in a toolbox and you don't necessarily look inside it too much. There isn't time or it's simply not a priority. So what we did with ImageNet, which of course is one of the most profoundly influential training sets in the history of machine learning, it really transformed object recognition, is that we started looking at it in some detail over multiple years and started to look at the categories where it classifies people. And of course, you know, ImageNet is in the main used for you know, classifying objects, but it does have this people category, um, which has thousands of images of people scraped off the internet and then put into these categories, which as you say, as we started to look at them, we found categories that were like profoundly racist, misogynistic, offensive, in some cases just illogical, like, you know, categories like data or colorblind, like, you know, what, what does that mean to have like images of people that are related to these kind of non-visual concepts? But it was, it was quite shocking for us to see that these categories and, and images of people had been out there for over a decade, relatively unexamined, um, and just used as though this was just you know how we train technical systems. 
And the response, I mean, certainly I know that the ImageNet team are now, you know, really looking very closely at these questions. They've now removed 660,000 images from ImageNet. Um, many of the people categories that, that we critiqued and, and sort of brought to light um, have now all been removed, which is, which is interesting to see. And other researchers as well um, have actually released papers looking at other training sets like uh, MIT's tiny images. Um, there's uh, Abiba Behane and other researchers produced a really important paper saying, you know, again, we're seeing the same problems in ImageNet in tiny images. And then, of course, Adam Harvey has done the same looking at sets like MS Celeb um, and the Duke MMTC set. So there have been these really important investigations. You ask the important question, which is what happens? Well, the first thing we see is that the sets either get taken down completely or they get sort of remediated, which means that you know some categories or terms are removed. And the question then is, is sort of twofold. Yes, it's, it's good that these really offensive terms sort of get removed, but then what we're starting to see is that these sets continue to circulate on things like academic torrents. They continue to be used and, and people don't sort of declare that they're using them. And also because so many production systems in the world now have been trained on those training data sets, when you can't see them anymore, you can't actually look at the underlying logics or the problems that might be emerging in those production systems that are affecting people's lives. So we need to think, I think much more carefully about what happens when training data sets get deprecated. You know, can they exist in ways so that there are much higher thresholds for how people access them and that we have an ongoing archive that researchers can look at to say, here's why we're seeing these problematic categorizations of people, because it comes from sort of these substrates, these sort of DNA building blocks of AI. So I think it's extraordinary to me that we don't have standards yet in in the AI industry around how these training sets will be used and not used and what happens with the afterlives of training data. Yeah, I think, I mean, so much of this data is collected um, in, it's kind of like if data exists, it should be collected to make AI better. There's a real push in that direction. And sometimes we have a privacy discussion, especially when the data is quite um, personal, you know, the, the this, this debate that's happened about the use of our faces, um, mm -hmm. particularly when there's a biometric law like in Illinois that gives you rights around it. Um, but other data, you know, the car companies are increasingly, you know, collecting data from cars because it can be used to make safer cars that can, you know, do automated driving. There's kind of so much of what we do now that leaves a digital trail. Um, and the push right now is that all data should be, you know, used, should be, um, should be in service to a kind of better enhanced technology. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if you think that conversation changes and if it changes, what, ch what, you know, what changes it? What is, what do we point to? Because I would say so far pointing to, you know, privacy hasn't really worked. Uh, and, it, and it cuts against, I mean, there's civil liberty groups that really push for the freedom to scrape um, because it is so important for lots of research um, that academics do. Uh, and, and so I'm not really sure where that debate goes. Um, it, are we ever going to be able to have a real fulsome kind of conversation about, you know, permissions to use data, that, right. that data that are, are pu both public and that are kind of just being uh, gathered from you because you didn't pay attention to the terms of service when you bought your car. <laughs> Exactly. Well, we're going to need to. Um, and certainly, you're, you're exactly right that sort of calls to privacy, I think, have, have, have failed us. And I think this idea of, you know, all data should be collected, this ideology that, you know, data is there for the taking and must be taken as much as possible is a trap. And the way that it will shift, I think, will be through sort of increased regulation and the amount of risk that you know, companies and institutions will have to carry if they intend to scrape and hold enormous amounts of data. So we are now starting to see lawsuits sort of specifically around that type of scraping. Um, we'll see what happens with those. But again, we're also seeing in the EU with these new uh, draft AI laws that the relationship to data scraping and the creation of training data sets, that's specifically there, you know, as 
as sort of regulatory priorities. And so that conversation is, I think, starting to emerge. But you've also raised a really interesting tension, which is that it is important for researchers to be able to scrape sites to understand how they work. But there's a difference there between, you know, are you doing an investigation? Is this for the purposes of science? Or are you trying to harvest and enclose enormous amounts of data for the purposes of profit? And I think you can make distinctions there. It's not as though that, you know, it's just one action that everybody performs. So we actually have to think at a much more granular level about what is this scraping for? You know, who is it serving and who might be harmed? And in doing that, I think you can have, you know, the sorts of frameworks that we have with any type of, you know, work that you might do in health data, for example, and, you know, we have bioethics for a reason to sort of look at what are the safeguards that we need around the way that data is used and collected. We haven't had that in these sorts of, you know, AI conversations, and it's absolutely overdue. So I think you're right, it's going to be an important teasing apart of these different sorts of activities and threads to say, what are you doing this scraping for and who is it in service to? You said when you try to create any map of the world, something gets left out. So as you created this Atlas of AI, what did you feel, you know, didn't fit into the book or, um, or that, uh, you would put into, uh, the next, the next Atlas? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting actually, because, you know, my publisher really wanted me to call this book the atlas of ai and, and i really pushed back against that because i'm like no it's just an atlas and we need many atlases you know the idea of an atlas is that you know they're unusual books they allow us to look at things at different scales you know you can look at a whole continent or you can zoom in to sort of a specific town and you know for me that was what we really need for artificial intelligence right now we need to understand scale that it's impacting at a planetary scale but also having these very localized and sort of intimate impacts on individuals and on communities but that can only ever be sort of one person's account you know there's this beautiful line um, by you know, the, the physicist and technology critic who I think is extraordinary, Ursula Franklin. She, she writes about how maps are ways of threading together sort of the known and the unknown, these sort of these documents of collective insight um, that can always be built upon. And, and certainly, you know, this book is coming out at a time where I think there's a profusion of new and emerging scholars and research, which is engaging critically with the impacts of technology. I mean, you know, I see this book as being in conversation with, you know, scholars like Julie Cohen and Ruha Benjamin and Simone Brown and Meredith Broussard, you know, there's like long lists of, of extraordinary scholars um, that I mentioned in this book, whose work I think is incredibly important. So I see sort of lots of emerging atlases, if you will, um, that are already starting to happen at this moment. I'd say the same is true, actually, of technology journalism. I think, you know, you're an example of people right now in the media who are actually doing much sort of deeper investigations of, of technical systems than we have even a decade ago. So that's also a really important mapping process, if you will. But then I also think about, you know, for me, you know, I wrote this book, you know, going to the specific sites where I saw AI being made in the sort of largest sense, you know, going to mines, you know, going to archives, going to labs, going to, you know, the, the workplaces where these, these tools are deployed. But there are many more sites that I couldn't get to and that others will. You know, I think there will be extraordinary atlases written from China. There will be extraordinary atlases, you know, written from the global south in places like India right now, where so many of these large-scale training data sets are being constructed, where so many workers are, you know, doing the crowd work of, of labeling and training AI or, or even just faking AI altogether. You know, all of these atlases from different parts of the world, um, from Russia as well, like I mean, this, again, really different histories of artificial intelligence in Russia, which I think are incredibly important here. So in so many ways, I think there will be many more atlases than there should be. And I don't think they should be coming from me. I think I, <laughs> that's my atlas. But I, you know, I, I want to see the atlases coming from, from different perspectives and from different parts of the world. The, the, the book is very much addressing down of the technology industry. I think in many ways, you know, the, the environmental impact, the, sometimes the flawed data sets, the, how the tech is used. Um, I'm curious what kind of feedback you have gotten from people in the industry. If there are, 
uh, very angry emails in your inbox and um, how you have responded to people who, you know, think that it's you know, too negative um, a treatment of, 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 you know, a tech sector that has brought many benefits to our lives, um, mm. yeah. even along with, you know, the, the problems and, and tolls. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been really interesting, actually, the degree to which, you know, particularly people who work inside technology companies as engineers have reached out and said, you know, thank you for writing this. You know, I've been seeing parts of this, you know, from my work and from my job, but I hadn't seen this other part or I hadn't put this part together. And so, you know, that's been kind of incredibly edifying, I think, in the sense that, you know, in the, the many years of producing this book, it really did require sort of speaking to a lot of different people working across the kind of entire sort of manufacturing processes of, of, of AI. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the people who I think have, have asked sort of more sort of negative questions around, well, you know, but AI does all of these amazing things too. And it's like, well, you know, there's an enormous marketing and advertising industries just dedicated to telling you all of the great things that AI does. Um, and you would know this as a journalist because you'd be getting those press releases every day. Um, you know, that kind of, that absolute onslaught of, you know, positive publicity, I think, is also part of the problem. I think people now are like, actually, no, we want to know the real story of how these systems work. And, and so often those positive stories, you know, are about, oh, here's this amazing system. And then a few years later, you never hear about it again. You know, who are the people who are relying on that who have now been cut off? Or what were the potential downsides of, of when that system served some communities, but not others? I think even in those glowing stories of how, you know, AI is, is changing the world, there are, there are stories contained within that around you know, who wasn't served or who actually, you know, who was harmed by a system. So I think what we need is, is, is a much more accurate account of how these technical systems work at a crucial time where they've scaled up from really being kind of quite experimental and sort of opt-in systems to you know, being systems that are everywhere touching everything from the public sector to the government to you know, everything we do. And there is no ability to opt out. You know, they are affecting so many people at once. So in that sense, I think it's the time to sort of really, it's, it's, I see this work not as negative, but as, as realistic, as actually coming up with a pragmatic account of what does it take to make those systems and how do they really work in the world? Um, I'm going to start turning to questions from the audience. So if there are people uh, who are listening, who have them, please submit them. Um, but I just have one last one of my own. And it's, it's, it, it's that you receive the emails from engineers at the company. And I would say as a tech journalist, I think I've seen a real change over the last decade that, you know, when I first started writing about technology in 2008, 2009, these companies were very locked down. It was hard to find internal critics of the companies. They were, you know, um, I think a lot of people that worked in them really believed in this mission that they were trying to make the world a better place, that the things that they were designing were very good for the world. And there wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of looking inward or questioning um, that kind of narrative. And I think that has changed in a huge way. Uh, and you see so much more criticism now coming from employees of the companies, former employees of the companies, you know, strikes, uh, Google with project Maven, um, where they were working with the government to, you know, better identify footage for drones and Google employees said, we don't want to be doing this. Um, I was hoping you could speak about that activism that we are starting to see from the tech sector and what that means for, um, yeah, a more kind of responsible approach to these products um, that it seems like uh, there's there's more of a voice of dissent within the companies now. Right. I mean, I think I've seen I've seen exactly the same thing. You know, certainly, you know, over the last six years in particular, you've seen a real movement inside the tech sector of people questioning those kind of those early kind of glowing narratives of, you know, these are the coolest, sexiest places to work to actually looking at well, what has happened, you know, what, what are the sort of negative impacts of, of something like Facebook, for example, where we've seen, you know, time and time again, you know, genuine harms produced, uh, both in terms of 
you know, around sort of democracy itself, but sort of in terms of, you know, the people who work inside those companies. And we've seen that again, sort of obviously playing out recently with Google. And that has, I think, ignited a movement that is many, many thousands of people strong, uh, people saying, no, we actually have a say in how these companies work. If we're going to be building these tools, first of all, we want to know what they're going to be used for. We want to make sure they're actually being used in ways that don't actually co you know, create havoc and harm around the planet. So that kind of shift, I think, has been, has been really powerful. And, and, and like you, what I see there is, I think, a, a, a sort of a coming conflict in terms of you know, how a company is going to respond to this kind of new movement of people saying, actually, no, we're going to hold the systems that we build to higher standards. My hope is that companies will actually realize that this is a gift to them. This is actually helping them understand where they can actually build systems and where they've been going wrong. But my fear is that, again, as we've seen with Google, is that you're going to see, you know, the opposite, is that companies kick out people who are sort of the loudest critics and voices and actually resist the kind of change that in many cases, you know, their employees are saying it's time, it's time to make these positive changes. So we're at a moment, I think, where we're going to see in the next couple of years how that type of activism is going to be metabolized or not. Um, so one of the questions from the audience is about the concentration of AI talent at the top 10 major tech companies. Um, and with the compounding benefits from AI and winner take all trends, um, whether we should be concerned about that, um, that these tech companies are just going to continue to uh, get larger and larger and win more and more and have more of the concentration of power in um, in those particular businesses. Right. Well, I mean, this is a, a well evidenced effect now, this this sort of when it takes all dynamic that, you know, the, the big tech companies and there really is just a handful of them have multiple factors, which are sort of forcing functions for increasing their resources and increasing their power. So you could think about sort of the data pipelines. So the companies that have the most data coming in are the companies that are actually going to have, you know, the most, you know, efficient and effective products. And again, they keep tuning those products if they have more data coming in. So if you're a Facebook, if you're an Amazon and you have all of those people, you know, buying products or writing reviews or messaging friends, that becomes training data for actually building AI systems that will create sort of, again, give them the impression of being highly effective AI systems that will keep getting better and better. So you do have those kinds of impacts happening right now, which makes it very difficult for companies to break in and actually sort of challenge that sort of very small group. Um, and, and I think you, you particularly see it at the level of infrastructure too. So if you think about what it takes to build large scale cloud infrastructure, it's enormously expensive. It's it's involving vast amounts of land, labor, and resources. And realistically, that's that's why we have sort of, you know, sort of fewer than five companies who can really run planetary scale cloud. And there are real questions about can anyone actually ever compete with that? You know, how would you catch up to it? So this is something that you know I, I address in the book to really sort of think about concentrations of power across the board when it comes to how the technology sector is, is sort of currently positioned, because this is going to be really difficult to address. It's, it's not as simple as you know, breaking companies up. I think it's actually a lot harder to say, what are those kinds of magnifying effects? You know, how does power itself get concentrated and then produce more kinds of insight can then be capitalized by those companies. You know, this is a tough problem. Um, and, you know, it, it really is going to be, I think, the biggest kind of regulatory question for the next few years. But I'm, I'm curious how you see this too, Cash, because, you know, you've seen these sectors really shift in, in your reporting. I mean, I can remember, you know, back in the day when you're at Forbes, you know, that this was, that was in that kind of glowy kind of tech optimism period where, you know, these were the, the tools that would transform the world and, and, and you know, increase the, 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 the reign of democracy far and wide. And I think that's really shifted and people are asking these questions. So how have you seen that change? And, and how would you imagine that those types of winner take all dynamics could be challenged? Well, um... It's interesting because well, as you're talking about, I was just thinking about whether more competition is better for 
more ethical use of AI or actually worse. Um, you know, what, what I've always seen covering privacy uh, in technology is that it's not usually the big companies that are doing the worst things. It's the companies you've never heard of. Um, and I think that's what's been so interesting about kind of some of the Adam Harvey work, the data sets that he's unearthed. I mean, people like being captured, um, their images being captured when they're in a coffee shop in San Francisco. It's just these small places where you wouldn't expect it um, to happen. So, like, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it, it does increasingly feel like these companies are controlling very powerful levers. You know, I did that experiment a couple of years ago where I tried to keep kind of the, the big five tech companies from getting my data um, by like using a, a router uh, or a specialized uh, VPN that kept me from connecting to their servers. And when it came to Google and Amazon, it was just impossible. I mean, they really control the very infrastructure of the web. They are the governments um, of this system that's keeping it running, Amazon Web Services, um, various tools that Google offers to, to websites and apps. Maps, Google Maps is just so dominant that um, yeah, you, you start to wonder whether, um, whether they'll lose that power in the same way that usually would like trends happen, you know, fads happen, uh, new, new giants arise, but they really control the very infrastructure. And so I'm not sure that we'll see the same kind of, uh, dilution of power that you would normally have, um, in a kind of capitalistic system. Right. And it, it is that question of infrastructure that I think is so important here. And, you know, it does take us back to that idea of, you know, is this traditional forms of capitalism or is it something else? Because it has some very unusual features. If, if there are infrastructures that are so powerful in their sort of, not just in terms of what they do, but in their sort of planetary scale. And if they, you know, cannot be sort of shifted or broken apart or you know competed with what what, what have we got there you know you, you've basically got this extraordinarily powerful system which lives entirely outside of sort of democratic processes um, and is essentially run by companies for whom you know the greatest priority is shareholder value you know that I think in some ways challenges our understanding even of the power of the nation state and, and this is something that we're starting to see more and more is the way in which tech companies are you know, acting in the way that nation states would act, and certainly in some cases are wealthier than many nation states. Um, and we saw this recently, in fact, in Australia, when in the process of, you know, negotiations with the Australian government over a piece of legislation that would have, you know, regulated both, you know, Facebook and Google and others, that Facebook's response was to shut off newsfeed, was to just shut down newsfeed for Australia. So, Australians weren't getting news from overseas. Australian media entities couldn't share their news stories internationally. It was a blackout. And it also, unfortunately, took out a whole lot of, you know, organizations that are working on information around health and healthcare. Um, and it, it was just an extraordinary disaster. But I think in some ways it sort of, it was the moment of unveiling what tech companies can do if they decide, well, we don't like this regulation. We can actually just shut down a set of systems and, and see what you'll do. So I, I think there's a moment now where it, it it's certainly been used to send out a particular type of warning to lots of, lots of nation states who are watching and seeing that. But I think what we can also think about what is the governance response, you know, how do nations work together to actually negotiate for, you know, fair and better terms for the way that technology companies operate? Like that's a hard question. Yeah, I think the tech companies have just become so powerful. And in, in the US, you know, regulation moves so slowly, the political system is in gridlock. And so many times now people are going directly to the tech giants trying to get them to solve, you know, societal problems. Can you fix can you fix misinformation and disinformation and false news? Can you just kind of cut it off since you are the infrastructure for providing it? Um, and it is, it's a, it's a, it's a real shift. Um, and I'm not sure where that's going to go. Um, uh, let's see a really good question here, um, touching on something that we talked about earlier, but how do you change the incentives of the developers of the AI, AI systems 
to get them aligned with, you know, societal needs and concerns? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing is we we have history to draw on here, and, and certainly you could look at you know so many sectors that initially were completely unregulated and didn't have sort of standards of production that gradually developed both a kind of you know commitment to this is what it takes to doing good work in this space, and these are the standards to which we hold our colleagues and peers and companies. So, I mean, even in journalism, you could sort of think about the fourth estate kind of going through it's sort of the huge shift from sort of yellow journalism to the idea that there are actual principles and practices and ethical codes for journalists to actually adhere to in their work that become just part of what you do. There have been many calls for, you know, why don't we have, you know, a similar sense of what are the kind of codes of practice built into computer science and engineering? I think it's time. You know, we, we do have, you know, some examples in some parts of engineering, but in computer science, it's, it's you know, very much, I think, a nascent conversation, and, and, and we really need that. So certainly, you know, we've seen groups like the ACM try to sort of update and develop stronger ethical codes. That's, I think, an important step, but it's it's necessary, but not sufficient, if we will. I mean, we, we are going to need, I think, these kind of stronger structures of regulation, but we're also going to need, you know, ways in which I think when you go to university, it will just be kind of part of how you are trained to build systems that certain things just aren't done, that you don't just sort of set up a camera in a cafe and just record people coming and going and then sort of use that as a training data set, you know, that, that you don't kind of uh, decide that the way that we should be, you know, conducting policing in the world is by creating ever more invasive systems that don't just track your face, but then try to predict from looking at your face if you might be a future criminal or not. I mean, these are things that have actually been done and published on. So, I mean, I think there are certain ideas and practices which are simply just beyond the pale and that to become part of a set of norms that become part of the field is, is mainly also what's maybe happening now. I mean, when you're seeing that tech clash, when you're seeing those shifts happening at the moment, I think that is that moment of cultural change. But, you know, it, it, it has to be done in a way that I think responds to the speed of these technical systems being rolled out. Because as you say, regulation is slow, norms and standards take time, and these systems are already impacting millions of people. There are a few questions about the kind of geopolitical future of AI. And I know, you know, you said earlier, this is an atlas of AI that's, you know, kind of mostly Western based, but as we're seeing these kind of AI giants rise in different countries, China, Russia, India, you know, and within the tech companies themselves, which are, you know, have revenues that are the, the size of some countries' GDP. What is your kind of prediction for the future in terms of who controls AI um, and how these different actors um, uh, treat each other or compete uh, for the right. best AI? Well, it's a really live debate right now, of course, and we're frequently being told about the AI war between the US and China. And, and I think this is really dangerous rhetoric in many ways, because it's creating this kind of framework where if people are told we're in a war, you know, we have to do everything we can. There should be no restrictions on what we build or regulation, because otherwise, you know, China will take over and they'll do what we won't do. You create this kind of race to the bottom dynamic. You create this kind of, I think, very predatory environment where people will use anything and everything they can to try and get an edge in a market and to see it almost as a kind of a, as a national priority to you know, create predatory systems. I mean, that to me would, would be an extraordinary downside. Um, so, you know, there's a history there too. I mean, in the book, I look at how we've seen these types of you know, nationalist rhetorics emerge. Again, in the 1980s, it was between the US and Japan. Um, and, you know, we're now seeing it play out with China. So how do we think about the current geopolitical stakes while at the same time acknowledging that there are AI superpowers, that we do see the US, China, and to some degree, Russia having just like enormous amounts of resources focused in this sector? What we are also seeing, which concerns me, is the rest of the world being sort of seen as an AI client state, as places where you test these products, where you see if they work and, you know, and if they do or if they don't, you know, those costs are borne by those countries. 
or they're seen as sort of the places of extraction, places where you just rip all of the data out and use it in, you know, in different terrains. So for that to work, you know, you'd have to start to think about what are international governance mechanisms. And to some degree, I think that's what the EU is trying to do. It's trying to say, we need to have international regulatory frameworks. Otherwise, I, I really worry that we've created this kind of system where, you know, again, the winner take all dynamics that we see with the tech companies are also happening at that sort of national level and challenging that early, I think is gonna be key. As we are trying to roll out AIs that work everywhere, um, that work around the world, we'll run into, again, the data sets, the data sets being wrong, the data sets being flawed, the data sets not taking into account culture and context. And so someone out there is asking how the data, how the data keeps up with that. How do you code the data properly? Um, at, uh, this person's job, they have an automated social media sentiment tool and, you know, it, in, it, it took the word dope instead of uh, recognizing it as, um, you know, saying something was cool. It, it coded it negatively as drugs. Um, you know, this, again, we see this again and again and again, but how do you counteract that? Is there is there a way to better, to like do a perfect classification of data? Uh, how do you even attempt that? Right. And, and this is interesting in the context of things like GPT-3, which is, you know, sort of the, the largest of the large language models that is you know, now, you know, harvesting large amounts of data and trying to do text prediction, trying to understand what a word means in context through just, you know, brute force and a sort of probability. And I think there's a fundamental problem there that if we look at the way that natural language processing works right now, the assumption is that a word has a singular meaning. You know, the dope means one thing and not many things depending on context and depending on how it's put in relation to other things. And that to some degree is certainly something that, you know, that natural language processing uh, labs and individuals are working on right now that you can again if you have enough examples of how a text appears you can say oh well there are these different kind of relational contexts but it doesn't get us part past this 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 core question that language is always in flux language is always changing if you look at the way that you know people spoke 50 years ago to now completely different terms were used you know to even to something like cool or awesome or dope are themselves, you know, cultural and historically specific ideas. So, you know, what does that mean when we're kind of training the machine, learn, machine learning systems of, of today on the data of the past? It means you're importing those kind of historical ways of speaking and understanding. You're importing those forms of structural bias and, and ways of seeing that are inherently offensive. And in many ways we've kind of moved beyond, but we keep getting dragged back into the past by those systems. So this is a fundamental question. How do we build machine learning systems to avoid those problems? And certainly when it comes to sentiment tools, you know, it's one of the, I think, most sort of shaky foundations because emotion and feeling and sentiment are so particular to individuals and to settings. So I think that this is, this is an issue of scale. This idea that I think the trap is that systems could scale to you know, address all contexts, all people at all times. That is, is being shown not to work. So we're gonna to have to think differently, I think, for the next generation of, of technological development. There are quite a few questions in here about whether there are any kind of good AI ethics watchdogs out there right now who are you know, investigating this, rating this, if you, there's a way to know if a company that you are um, a consumer of uh, is using AI ethically. So yes and no, and there are certainly lots of researchers and there's now, I think at last count, at least sort of 15 research institutes um, in the US and beyond that are looking at these sorts of questions, publishing reports, you know, assessing what companies are doing. Um, but we don't sort of have AI ombudsmen or you know, commissioners who are looking specifically at these issues. And in fact, there was a report issued just yesterday um, by the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, really recommending that there should be an AI safety commissioner that would look precisely at these sorts of questions and make public announcements around where things are working, where things are not working. 
But I want to suggest one thing here, which is that there's, I think, a, a tendency to imagine that this is a, you know, a consumer action problem, that, you know, if we could just have a label that said, this is ethical AI, you know, that that would be okay. Um, I, I, I really don't think this, this gets down to being a consumer level problem. It's too hard for us to see into these systems. It's extremely difficult. As you know, as an as a investigative journalist and, and as, as a researcher, I see the same thing. So I think this really is much more of a collective action question. And therefore that's why it sits at the level of sort of, you know, government structures, you know, how can we actually have these national and international bodies doing that kind of work so that you know there are real restraints put on companies that would be doing these i think quite profoundly unethical and damaging things um in in the meantime i think you know i i there are lots of researchers that i trust i mean i think about someone that we both know, you know ashkan sultani and his you know his early work really testing these systems and publicizing how they work you know there are many examples of people like that now um where i think you know it, even it serves as like the markup, like the markup has this extraordinary team of journalists who are sort of, again, sharing with the world how these systems work. We now need those superstructures. We now need things in place that can actually say, okay, now we know how this works. Where's the accountability? How do you actually make sure they don't keep operating that way? That's the piece that I think is missing from the ecology right now. So for my last question, I just want to ask, what is your ideal future? for how we treat AI, how it is integrated into society. Um, the, yeah, anyways, that's mm. what I ask. Your perfect future. Just, just a small question, <laughs> but just a little one to, to wrap yeah. up. I love that, Kat. Um, look, there, there are so many things I think we can do better. And, and interestingly, like, there's lots of low hanging fruit. I mean, you know, I, I keep thinking of, of a project that was led by Timnit Gebru um, uh, that I worked on with several colleagues where we created this idea of data sheets for training sets. Like there were, that the fact that there was no standardized like information mechanism to even say what was inside a training data set and how it worked blew us away. And that, that was like sort of the first initiative to do that. You know, that can scale. There are lots of other ways in which we can start to understand how systems are built. So things like that, I think are, you know, certainly the easy steps. There are much harder ones um, in terms of how we actually construct AI in the future. Um, and it means looking at these questions around climate justice, around labor rights, and around data protections. It means looking beyond just this, I think, very narrow technical account of you know, abstract mathematical systems and grounding them in the world and saying, what are those impacts? You know, that's the kind of certainly you know, the world that I want to see in terms of how we start to understand and write about and regulate uh, AI and technology more broadly. And then I guess also if there's, if there's one final thing, you know, I, I think there's something really powerful and optimistic happening at the moment, which is that, you know, we're seeing a real shift away from, you know, that type of techno optimism to something which is much more centered on well, you know, how are people being affected? Let's let's look at affected communities. Let's think about questions around justice and sustainability. And you know, that I think is 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 really the most important political trajectory that I can see right now, and is certainly going to be more important as we continue to see the planet be under further strain and we start to see you know the widening gaps of inequality be addressed. Um, so for me, these are the kind of key issues that are certainly front of mind. But how about for you? I would love to hear from you, Cash, as a final thought. How would you like to see the world change, particularly in relation to tech development? Oh, man. Um, maybe a little less technology in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I was, when I, when I was giving up the tech giants, at one point, I did have to go back to you using a Nokia flip phone because you can't get a smartphone at the time you couldn't get a smartphone made not made by Apple or Google and um yeah it was it was kind of nice to step away from a computer and just be offline and only be called so uh i i do think during this during that time and then also during the pandemic it made us both be more online than we've ever been before and kind of forced us offline into the real world. And I do think there were some benefits to shutting down the world for a little while, um, even environmentally seeing, you know, populations come back. So it, it's hard to do, especially when, when everything is moving so fast and you get wrapped up in it. But I do very much worry about the environmental impact of the way that we're choosing to live now.
completely agree. And, you know, it, it, if there's one thing that the pandemic has taught us is that so many of these issues that we research and have been writing about for years have actually accelerated and amplified everything from, you know, surveillance and privacy uh, invasions through to the way in which these systems are just consuming vast amounts of energy and resources. So, you know, that's going to be a big one is, is thinking about how that can change. Such a pleasure. Wonderful to talk to you, Cash. Thank you for having us. Um, Computer History Museum. Uh, <laughs> do, do you guys want to take back over the show to, to say goodbye? Yes, thank you both very, very much. Thanks, Cash. Thanks, Kate. I think you touched on some amazing things um, that are fundamental and on everyone's mind. You mentioned the words political economy. We talked about the environment. I think at the end of the day, we're all environmentalists. Not everyone actually acts on it. Um, and if you think about the fact that computing in the beginning was all about people and people built computers at CHM, you know, and decoding technology for everyone and looking at the promise and perils, the conversation that you teed up today was about people. It was about comparative advantage. It was about scale. And at the same time, there was a human condition that was factored into all of your comments. And you know, we are very much all focused on the human conditions and how life as we know it doesn't exist without computing. So the question that we have to answer is, you know, how do we wanna live? So I'd like to thank you both for the program. I'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in. And I'd like to encourage all of you who love these kinds of programs to go to our website and encourage you to join and give to CHM. If not now, I don't know when, coming out of the pandemic, we're doing okay, but more is better. So thanks for your interest, support, and a wonderful program today. Best of all, and have a nice long weekend.